Hey everyone, what's going on? It is Stephen Wagner with the Tech Journal at www.stephenwagner.com. Today we are adding yet another video to the series that I've uh, been working on titled Windows Server 2022. In the last video, we created a member server and joined it to a Windows Server 2022 domain. And in this video, we are going to be installing, configuring, and deploying WSUS, also known as Windows Server Update Services. Just to give you a quick brief overview about WSUS, Windows Server Update Services is a service that comes on Windows Server that allows you to manage and maintain Windows updates for your corporate environment uh, and Active Directory domain. Essentially, system administrators use WSUS to approve, decline, stage, and push updates uh, to Windows servers as well as Windows clients. Um, it's a really powerful service, I want to say platform or, or software, but it's built in. It's just a service inside of Windows Server uh, that essentially allows you just to keep your environment up to date. It's, it's great. I use it for customers. I use it in my own environment. Um, you can configure it so that on the server that you have set up, you configure an update store. So all the updates that you approve, um, of course, you only approve the ones that are needed, uh, get downloaded to a certain directory on the server. And then instead of, you know, let's say that you have 12 servers running in like 50 workstations, instead of all 12 servers and 50 workstations reaching out to Windows Update servers, um, instead, they'll just reach out to your Windows Server Update Services server and grab those updates, substantially saving you on crazy amount of bandwidths, allowing you to control which updates get deployed and uh, giving you visibility into any updates that... Uh, uh, that your environment is actually having trouble deploying because there are some reporting capabilities that let you know if there's uh, certain updates that are having issues getting installed onto workstations, computers, servers, etc., etc., etc. So nonetheless, let's get to it. So in the last video, uh, I'll just uh, share my screen here. You'll notice we have TN-SRV01. That is our Windows Server 2022 domain controller. And we have our TN-SRV02 member server. In the last video, we installed uh, Windows Server 2022 onto this virtual machine. Uh, and we also joined it to the domain, configured a static IP address and did that. Um, before recording this video, what I did do to this video virtual machine, though, is I went ahead and added a secondary hard disk. So I created a 400 gigabyte thin provision disk. And the reason why I did that is because I want to have a, a store for all the updates. Now these update stores can get rather large. We're talking hundreds of gigs, possibly even in the terabytes, depending on how large your environment is. Now there are certain maintenance procedures that you can initiate that will clear updates that have been deployed so that you don't have to keep maintaining them and that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into that into that in this video. This video is strictly showing you how to install, configure, and deploy Windows uh, Server Update Services on a Windows Server 2022 server. So, so I've created that hard disk too. Haven't done anything inside of the operating system yet. Uh, jumping to our network documentation. So right here, we've got TN-SRV member server, Windows server. Services are marked as to be determined. So we're just going to go ahead and change that to WSUS. We want to make sure that we keep this documentation up to date. I'll be using this in all my future videos for this specific series. And uh, so let's get to it. So I'm just going to power this box up. And this is actually quite a fairly easy install to do. Um, essentially, you just add the server role, configure it, restart the server, and then you have to modify something called group policy objects on your domain controller. And what we're doing with the group policy objects is these are policies that get deployed to computers in the domain. Uh, it allows you to do central management. And essentially, using a GPO, we will be telling servers, workstations, laptops on the domain to reach out to TN-SRV02 instead of Windows updates on the internet. So we'll get to that once we do this. So we're just going to go ahead and log into this machine. And 
just to be safe, we're going to open up our networking and settings. Just make sure that we do have a static IP configured. I'm usually pretty good at doing this, but I just want to make sure. So we've got 10.11, which is fantastic. So to make this easy, what we're going to do is we're just going to click on start and we're going to open up the server manager which in previous videos I showed you can add, remove server roles, features, manage the server roles and features that we have installed and do a whole bunch of other stuff. So, and actually what's really interesting is that if we really, really wanted to, we could actually open up server manager on the domain controller, go to all servers and actually add tn-srv02 to this list. And we could actually remotely add the server role, which is kind of pretty cool. But for the purpose of this video, just to keep it simple, what I'm going to actually do is just uh, go in on the actual server itself. So we'll just go back to the dashboard. Um, oh, and actually, before we get started, I almost forgot about this. We have that second disk, which I think was about 400 gigs. So we need to format that and make it available to the system. So what I'm going to do is I just want to see what driver letters are available. So we've got C, we've got D, which is the DVD. And so I'm going to go to start and I'm going to go to computer management. Inside of computer management, I'm going to open up disk management. And so here you'll see that we have a 400 gig disk that we haven't touched. So I'm going to mark this puppy as online. Then I'm going to click on the unallocated space. This should come online shortly. We might have to go to refresh. Not a list. Oh, sorry. We have to initialize it. Um, I'm going to do GPT. I don't even, it doesn't really make a difference. We're not booting from it, so it's not too big of a concern. And then we're going to click on this new simple volume. Next, we want to make sure that it takes advantage of all the available free disk space on that volume. We're going to give it E. And we'll just call this data or data. Data, data. And we're going to do a quick format. And so now if we close this, You'll notice that inside of this PC, we have the data drive E colon with about 400 gigabytes of free disk space. This is where we're going to be storing the WSUS updates. So now back to the server manager, we want to install the WSUS role. So we're going to click on manage, add roles and features. And we're going to click on next. It's going to be a role based installation. We're doing it on TN SRV02, which is this server. And if we scroll down, you'll see Windows Server Update Services. I was hoping that it would show us. but So these are the features that are required as a prerequisite for WSUS. So, you know, there's not, not much you can do about this, but just I just want to show this in the video just so that you're aware it does install some components. WSUS uses uh, IIS, Internet Information Services, to uh, provide WSUS to your network. So that's an interesting and fun fact. So we'll just click on Add Features. So here we've got Windows Server Update Services checked. We'll click on Next. And again, we don't. it automatically added the features that we need, so we don't need to touch anything inside of the feature list. So now since we're installing and we've selected WSUS, this is going to show up in the list now. And uh, so it essentially allows administrators to manage the download and installation of updates from the Microsoft Update website to the local network. So we'll just go ahead and hit Next. We don't need to touch any of these default settings. If you have a drive formatted with NTFS and at least six gigs of free space, you can use it to store updates. Now this is very, very important because this is where we're going to choose the path for the disks, uh, choose the path for the updates to be saved. So we wanna make sure that we do this properly because if we leave it to the C drive, to the default, if we don't select anything, what's gonna end up happening is that it's gonna fill the C drive up to the point where there's not gonna be any room. And that's why we created the 400 gig disk. So, uh, locally store updates in the following location. Choose a valid local path on TNSRV or remote. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to open up the file explorer, go to the data drive. We're going to create a new folder and we'll just call this WSUS. And so the full path, just by clicking on the address bar here is E colon slash WSUS. And so we're just going to paste that in there. And then it tells us about how it uses IIS. There's some extra options here. We don't really need to select anything because we're not touching any of this. So just to take a look at the list, we'll just go ahead and hit next. 
Um, and again, it gives us the option to restart the server once the rules uh, are installed successfully. I, I don't like to do this. Again, I don't have any other software running in the background, but I don't like it when servers automatically restart themselves, just in case you have Notepad open with notes or you have applications running or processes running or something's going on. So I'm not gonna have that checked, but I'm gonna go ahead and hit install. And so this might take a little bit of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shut off the webcam and probably speed this footage up until it gets to the point where we can do something else. And we're back. Feature installation has completed. And you'll see that configuration is required. Now, inside of the summary here, you don't want to jump the gun and hit close because there are tasks to complete. Now, if you were to accidentally hit close, um, you'll see that up here we have a notifications flag. If you accidentally close the wizard, there's pending notifications. So you'd actually, for example, launch post installation tasks. If you were to click on this flag, you'd be able to do the same from there. So don't worry too much. But if you accidentally close it, that's how you would recover it. So. Uh, next up, Windows Server Update Services. Additional configuration must be performed before continuing. We're going to go ahead and launch the post installation tasks. And I believe this should open up a window. It's been a little while since I've done this. I don't know if we should take bets whether or not this is actually running something in the background that will just automatically complete, or if it's gonna open up a wizard that we need to continue. I do know that there is an additional wizard, but I don't know if it gets launched right now, or if it gets launched when we open up the WSUS MMC. So you'll notice that Briefly, there was a process running, but then it disappeared. I could be wrong, but this might actually be preparing the... Um, WSUS uses SQL Express. Uh, sorry, not SQL Express exactly. It uses something called WID, which stands for Windows Internal Database. WID is, I guess you could call it a sister to SQL Express, um, very similar. You can even use SQL Management Studio to manage it if you know how to connect to it. Um, it actually, I believe it stores all the databases inside of C colon slash Windows slash WID. And I believe that that's actually what's happening right now at this moment is that it's preparing it. Because you'll also see that Windows PowerShell is running there in the background, which I believe means that the system is doing something. So I'm going to go ahead and hit close here. And then I'm just going to keep an eye on the task manager just for a little while longer. WSUS can be very fragile at times. You want to make sure that if you kick off a task that you give it the amount of time that it takes to complete. Um, there's also maintenance that has to be done on the database. So if you're running this on a day-to-day -day base, um, very frequently you need to clean up the database. There's an assortment of a couple SQL scripts that you can use, which will re-index the database, get rid of old updates. And then also inside of the WSUS MMC, you also have the ability to use a server cleanup wizard, which I recommend you do very, very frequently because if it gets to the point, actually all the time it gets to the point where if you don't run it and you let enough data accumulate as it's running those cleanup tasks what's funny is that on older versions i don't know if it applies to windows server 2022 but on previous versions um, what would happen is that it would kick off a maintenance task and the mmc would actually time out and you would lose the connection to wsus and i believe that this was due to iis i have a couple uh, blog posts on my blog that cover how to increase this timeout to avoid corruption, but it can actually result in corruption to the point where you actually have to reinstall WSUS from scratch, which is not fun. So again, I'm not gonna get in that video, but it's just something worth noting. Do your own research, check out my blog, look for those blog posts. Just jump into the search and type in WSUS. You'll find a whole bunch of content relevant to this that'll help you uh, deploy, maintain, and uh, keep your environment running smooth. So I'm just going to assume at this point 
we don't have too much CPU usage that WSUS has completed. We're going to click on the notifications flag here. It says that post deployment configuration has been completed. We're going to clear this out. Configuration required, which we already took care of. We're going to clear that out and we'll go ahead and close this. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on start and I'm going to type in Windows Server Update Services. So you can see that it installed the MMC. We're going to click on this guy. And so here's the initial configuration wizard. Um, so it just goes in to make sure that the firewall is allowed to allow clients to access the server, uh, connect to the internet, because you want to make sure that it has internet access to download the index of the database uh, of Windows updates as well as the updates themselves. And then some stuff about proxy servers. So we're going to go ahead and hit next. No, we would not like to join the Microsoft Update Improvement Program, but thank you very much. We are going to, now with WSUS, you have the ability to synchronize directly from Microsoft Update or in larger and more complex environments, you might actually have a master WSUS server sitting at the top of a hierarchy that you actually have a number of smaller WSUS servers uh, syncing from that upstream server. That way you have some control over to what you can um, approve and the updates you can cache higher up and then have that distribute to a number of other sites. This is very handy if you have an organization with multiple locations um, that are separated and you don't want to have a whole bunch of uh, traffic going uh, over the VPN. For example, let's say that you had two locations. You had 100 computers at Office A, 100 computers at Office B. Now, if you had the 100 computers at Office B connecting over the site-to-site -site VPN, connecting to the WSUS server at Office A, that would mean that if you had one single update, it would have to replicate that update 100 times to those 100 workstations. If you had a secondary WSUS server, or if you had it and had that configured and then had the main set up as an upstream, it would download the update once to that second WSUS server. And then, so it would consume the amount of bandwidth to copy the update once. And then that would distribute it to the 100 computers at Office B. So again, it's about planning the network, understanding the environment you're working with and thinking of this to optimize um, bandwidth usage, configuration, deployment, and that sort of thing. So we're just going to be synchronizing from Microsoft Update. We do not need a proxy server, so we're going to hit Next. And here we're going to have to do our initial connection. If I remember from the past, this can take a long time. However, I just upgraded my internet connection to a full one gig up and one gig down connection. So technically, this might not take too long. All depending on how busy Microsoft's servers are and how fast the connection is to their data center. I was really hoping to see a little bit more traffic going across the line there. And actually what I'm gonna do is I'm going to turn off the webcam and we'll speed this up so you don't have to live through it. Alrighty, so it took, <laughs> it took that a little while to complete. What is it? It's 10.02. I think I started about 12, 14 minutes ago. So the taskbar is full of green and we can now click on next. So here we have our language selection. In my case, I am only going to install updates for the English language. And that actually I removed it. So we'll just make sure that's checked and then just scroll. Those are all the available languages. We're going to hit next. So here is product selection. Now, some system administrators are very, very lazy and just select everything. Um, I think in uh, quite a few versions of Microsoft, I think it was back in the day of Microsoft Small Business Server, it actually shipped with everything. Um, I usually like to go through here and only select what's needed. 
Now this might take a while, so I'm just going to probably mute the microphone and uh, just skim through here. But essentially we're looking for later versions of Windows Server, we're looking for later versions of Windows 10, we're looking for um, Windows Server Update Services, pretty much any components that we want to use. Let's say that we were planning on deploying Microsoft Exchange, we would want to make sure that Microsoft Exchange was selected for the specific version that we're going to install. And actually, I'll just guide you through this. So we don't need works. Oh, Jesus is a big list. So here's Windows. We'll choose all the versions of Windows 10, Windows 11. We'll get rid of Windows 2000 because it's end of life. We'll get rid of Windows 7 because it's end of life. We'll get rid of all of 8.1. Eight. We don't need Windows embedded. Some of the stuff you might not know what it is, so be very careful because you might deselect a component that's actually required for your environment. So just keep that in mind when choosing this. Definitely don't need updates for Windows Server 2003 or 2008 or 2012. Now, I don't know if this applies, but we are we do have a Active Directory that while it is installed on Windows Server 2022, um, you'll remember from the previous video that it runs at a Windows Server 2016 functionality level. I highly doubt that we'll need any updates from Windows Server 2016, but I'm going to keep it selected as well as Server 2019 just in case. It shouldn't create too large of a payload. You'll notice there's some other things in here like Windows Server Drivers, Windows Server Manager to keep the uh, Server Manager up to date. We definitely don't need Vista, we don't need XP, we don't need Microsoft Works. We don't need Windows Small Business Server. We don't need Windows Live Essential Business Server. We don't need Windows Embedded. Azure Pack, I'm going to leave selected just because there is quite a bit of Microsoft Azure integration with Windows Server 2022. I may need this for future videos, so I'm going to leave that selected. If you're not planning on doing anything in, the, in your environment, you could probably deselect it. Windows Admin Center is another thing that I'm probably going to do a video on, so I'm going to leave that selected. Don't need Virtual Server. Don't need Systems Management Server. We also don't need SCC. Now, you'll remember that I mentioned that WSUS sits on top of WID, which is uh, derived from SQL management, uh, from SQL Express. So I am going to leave SQL Server because I believe that there might be some updates for it inside of there. I don't know what's, what version of SQL Express WD, WID is based off of in Windows Server 2022, so it's best for, just for me to leave those all selected. We're gonna get rid of Skype for Business. Leave Silverlight, we'll keep PowerShell. Now Microsoft Office, I don't know if I have any plans on deploying this, but we will get rid of 2002, 2003, 2007, 2010, 2013. We don't need Office Communication Server, Network Monitor. You'll see that there's a lot of products that we don't actually require. don't need Microsoft Link. We don't need Health Vault. I'm kind of surprised that's actually inside of there. I think they've actually end of life to Health Vault. We don't need Dynamic CRM. That is a very large package. More Azure stuff. We don't need Internet Security and Acceleration Server. We don't need the High Performance Computing Pack. Don't need Forefront. I don't know what expression is. I've never seen that before. Exchange, we might be doing a video on this, so I am going to keep Exchange 2016 and 2019. Developer tools, we'll keep that. We don't need BizTalk server. We'll keep Bing. Probably don't need to, but we'll keep it. Azure IoT, we do not need. File sync, I might be doing a video on that, so we'll keep that. And again, I'm sorry that you have to go through the pain of watching me individually select these. Anyways, we're good to go. So now we can finally hit next. Now we move on to classifications. 
So you'll notice that we got critical updates, definition updates. So critical updates are going to be security updates for attacks that are zero day or high, high criticality. I don't even know if that's a word. Then we have definition updates, which are going to be the definition updates for Windows Defender. Uh, driver sets we won't use because we don't, I don't know if I want to, they're, they're pretty large. And I've noticed in the past that Windows Server Update Services has a problem selecting the actual drivers that are required. I think I tried it a couple times and for some reason it was telling me that a specific machine needed a ton of drivers and it didn't. And it really screwed things up and it downloaded some very large packages. So we're going to skip drivers. We're going to skip driver sets. We are going to select feature packs. We are going to select service packs, tools, updates, roll, update rollups, and updates. So we'll hit next. Now here is the sync schedule, which schedules WSUS to reach out to Microsoft servers and, and re-download that index of updates. So keep in mind that this doesn't actually download updates. If you have any automatic approvals, then it will automatically download those after the synchronization is done. If it detects new updates, it'll download it. But this is strictly just for the index of updates. So we're going to have this go automatically and um, we will set it for 3 a.m. every morning. And actually, let's do two synchronizations per day. These synchronizations can be very large. So if you split it up, um, it'll free up the resources of the system quite a bit. And then, of course, we're finished the wizard. And so we have the option to do the um, initial synchronization. Now, keep in mind that this probably will take some time. And I think that this will actually be a very large payload. This is just, again, the index of the update. So we'll hit next. We Sorry, we check that box. Begin initial synchronization. We hit next. And then, of course, we hit finish. And so here we have the Windows Server Update Services, MMC. We'll expand the server name. So from the overview on the left, you'll see the server. You'll see the updates, all updates, critical updates, security updates, WSUS updates. You'll also see computers. Now, no computers know how to reach out to this WSUS server as of yet. Once we configure the GPOs, the group policy objects, uh, and deploy those and they take effect on the, the machines, whether it be a Windows server or a Windows 10 workstation. Um, once they learn how to reach out to the WSUS server, when we go in here, we'll actually be able to go to computers, status, any, refresh, and it'll actually show us the computers that have reached out to the server. You'll also notice that we have downstream servers. So if this was an upstream server, in this list, we would actually see downstream WSUS servers. Going back to that example that I was talking about earlier with the second Office B with 100 computers. And here we've got some information on synchronizations that you can use for troubleshooting. And there's also reports that you can run. And then finally, we have options. And so everything that we configured in the initial wizard, you can find inside of options here. So we can go in here, we can update the source, we can change it to an upstream server. Microsoft updates, we can configure a proxy server. We can also change the products and classifications. We can see the update files and languages. We can change the synchronization schedule. You can also configure automatic approvals. Now, some system administrators like to do this. I don't like to install any updates that I don't know what they are, um, especially because there was a couple years back where there was a few Microsoft updates, Windows updates that caused some issues. Um, so in my case, I did not have automatic approvals enabled, which means that I was actually able to go in and select the problematic updates that were actually killing some workstations and decline them to stop them from getting installed onto the systems. Um, this saved a huge headache for me, especially when I was managing, I think around 400 systems across six different clients. So now if we go to, uh, you'll also notice that we have computers and the server cleanup wizard. This is the cleanup wizard that is very, very, very important to run on a regular basis. I'm not going to click on it just because I believe that the system is doing its initial synchronization. But there's about six or seven different options where you can clean up computer data, you can clean up update data, you can remove superseded updates, you can remove updates that aren't required anymore, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, we also have uh, reporting rollup, email notifications, the Microsoft Improvement Program and some personalization. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna click on the server TNSRV02. And you'll notice this is the main panel that you'll always be looking at. And you can see that uh, synchronization status is running. It's sitting at about 10%. Um, I probably will have to step away and let this run, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. 
And if we open up Task Manager, we should be seeing some traffic. No, we're not. Actually, while we do the initial synchronization, let's jump over to the Active Directory server and configure the group policy object to point computers towards the Windows Server Update Services server. Now, you'll notice that we jumped onto TNSRV01, which is our domain controller. So we're just going to log on here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Start, and I'm going to go to Group Policy Management. Now, I always use these shortcuts where I just click and start and type in the first couple letters of the words. But again, you can either do this method, or you can click on Start and go to Windows Administrative Tools, and then you'll notice that it's also listed inside of here. So I always cheat and do the shortcut, but you can do anything. And actually, if you go in this way, you can actually see what other MMCs are available. So we'll just open up Group Policy Management. So once this opens up, we're going to expand the force. We're going to expand the domain. We're going to... So this is the general view of the GPO MMC. So we have our default domain policy. We have a folder that contains all of our group policy objects. So we have our domain controller policy. And we also have our default domain policy. And so now I've seen some really sloppy system administrators just go into the default domain policy and assign it there. Typically, you do not want to do this. What we're going to do is we're going to go to group policy objects and we're going to right click and create a new policy. And we're going to call this WSUS GPO. So you'll see that it's in the list. It has in on the right side here, you'll see the links. You'll notice that it hasn't been linked to any sites, domains, or OUs as of yet. Security filtering is set to authenticated users, which is completely fine. And if we go to settings, this is a report of all the settings configured. You'll notice that we actually have no configured settings again because it's brand spanking new. So what we'll do is we'll just right click on WSUS GPO, go to edit. We're gonna maximize this window. And I believe if we go to computer configuration, preferences, and uh, geez, I thought I had it on my other window here. Bear with me while I look this up very quickly. It's always fun trying to find the location of certain group policy object configuration. So computer configuration, Preferences. Oh no, sorry, it's under Policies, Administrative Templates, Windows Components, and then I think we sneak down to Windows Update. And so here's all the settings and the tunable items for Windows Update. So now there's, in, in my environment, there's actually quite a few configuration options I've changed. The big one is what we want to do today is just have the clients reach out to the WSUS server. And so to do that, we are going to look for something that starts with S. So we're looking for specify intranet Microsoft update services location. And so when we open this, you'll see that it's not configured, which means that it's set to default. Um, in a default environment, Windows Update will just connect directly to Windows Update or Microsoft Update. We're going to double click on this. We're going to go to enabled. And this is where we actually specify our options. For what we want to do. So set the intranet update services for detecting updates. Now what we're going to do is um, we haven't done any special configuration. So technically in a perfect world, if you're doing a production deployment, you would want to enable SSL, assign an SSL certificate and have all the WSUS traffic going over SSL. Now there's no username and passwords. It's strictly update information. So to my knowledge, and feel free to correct me in the comments of this video, but there's nothing that's really too security sensitive that goes across this line with the exception of the data showing how out of date certain computers are. Now, I don't know how often this type of information gets intercepted. I've never heard of an incident. I'll leave that up to you. But technically, in the perfect world, you would want to have SSL, um, but you might probably be able to get away with not using it. So I'm just going to type in HTTP colon slash slash, and then we're going to type in TN-SRV02. 
and the default port is 8530. Now, if it was running over SSL, it would be HTTPS colon slash slash TN dash SRV02, and the port, instead of 8530, it would be 8531. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy and paste this to the internet statistics server. And then we don't need an alternative download server. I don't think we need to configure any of these other items. And it's just configured to use the system proxy. We, we don't need a proxy, but we'll just leave that to default. So we're just gonna go ahead and hit apply and hit okay. Now, I'm just looking through my list here. I just want to make sure that there's nothing else important. So there's a couple other things that you could take a look at if you want to. So if we jump into, there should be one called configure automatic updates. So I'm not going to touch any of these settings in this video, but if you did want to, you technically could at the same time jump in here. You could enable this GPO set tunable, uh, you know, configure automatic updating, Actually, let, let's do this. So we're going to set it to auto download and notify for install. And it's going to check every day at 3 a.m. We're not going to install during automatic maintenance. And we're just going to hit apply and OK. And then there's uh, one update here that I'm going to briefly mention. If you are familiar with managing Windows 10 machines, there is another tunable. Now, if this is your first time, don't pay attention to anything that I'm doing here, but there is, I don't know where the setting is. I think it's called system. So now when you do a fresh install of Windows 10, there are components like language packs, um, voice and speech packs. If you have an environment that you're running WSUS, typically that it, this might have changed in the last couple of years, but in the past, these packs were not part of the WSUS line of patchable updates or payloads. So essentially you could, you know, for example, whether in the, you're in the United, I think it ships standard with the United States, but if you're in Canada and you wanted to install the, the Canadian language and voice and speech pack, uh, for example, to use Cortana or Bing, what would happen is that it would attempt to download the, uh, the speech packs, but it would fail because it would actually be reaching out to the WSUS server, which doesn't have those updates. I don't even think it shows to approve them. And so I have a blog post again, feel free to go to my blog, search for w WSUS and you might find this post. But this specific option, if you enable this, you can configure it so that if the Windows 10 workstation needs to install a component such as the voice packs that's not on WSUS, this will actually reach out to Microsoft Update servers to install the optional components as well as component repairs. So this is pretty handy. So what we do is, uh, it's pretty simple. We just hit enable. And then we can select uh, download repair content and optional features directly from Windows Update instead of Windows Server Update Services. And in this case, it'll bypass the approvals for those specific optional components, um, but it'll allow them to install and pass. So we'll just, for the sake of this video, we'll just turn that on. Again, this isn't required. This is just for those speech packs and, and stuff like that. So now that we've configured that, we're gonna close the GPO editor. So we have the settings here, but it's not applied. now. In a normal environment, let's say that you had a whole bunch of servers, you had a whole bunch of computers. You know, if you open up Active Directory Users and Computers, you know, inside of here under Computers, you'd create um, you'd create a folder or an OU for your servers. You'd create uh, an OU for servers, workstations, laptops, the whole deal. And then from that point on, what you would do is you would apply this, you'd create a GPO for your member servers, you'd create a GPO for your domain controllers, you'd create a uh, GPO for your workstations, uh, one that's specific to WSUS, so you can control how they install. So for example, like you would want your Windows 10 workstations to automatically install updates every morning and at three o'clock in the morning. However, you do not 
I repeat, you do not want your domain controllers or member servers to install those updates and automatically restart at three o'clock because your servers technically should be running backups, right? And so you can see why on servers, you would wanna have scheduled maintenance. You don't want the servers installing updates on their own and you don't want them restarting the servers on their own. And that's why you would actually have different policies. Now for this specific example, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to, uh, this is against best practice. I'm gonna take the WSUS GPO and I am going to link this So I just drag and drop it over to stephenwagner.com and this is gonna do a blanket over the entire domain. So here it says, do you wanna link the GPOs that you have selected to this domain? So we're gonna hit yes. So now you're gonna see that stephenwagner.com, it has the default domain apl policy applied to it as well as the WSUS GPO. Now on the right hand side, you're also gonna see the status here. Link enabled, yes. Security filtering to authenticated users. Details, we've got everything configured technically we could disable user configuration settings because we're only using the computer configuration settings. I'm just gonna leave this because that's on beyond the scope of this video. And if you go to settings and we go to show all, you'll see that when we scroll down, we've got computer configuration and these are the, uh, the GPO settings that get applied. And now that we've done this, we can actually go ahead and close out of the GPO manager. So I'm gonna click on start. We're, on the, we're still on the domain controller. I'm gonna open up an administrative command prompt. And in here, I'm gonna type in GP update slash force. And what this does is this tells the system that you run this command on to do a group policy update and force those settings. Sometimes it'll tell you that a restart is gonna be required, other times that it's not. You can see in this case that it's not. So I'm gonna hit exit. And technically now the domain controller We go to Windows Updates. You'll notice now that it says some settings are managed by your organization, and that's actually because of those GPO settings. And actually, you can see right here policies that are set on the device. Device intranet update server service for detecting updates has been set. Download automatically. Set automatic update options. So you can tell that these these settings took effect. Now, what I want to do is. Usually you'd see something that says check for updates. So I don't know if it's reached out to the WSUS server yet. I'm gonna kick those off. Oh, actually, here we go, check for updates. So we're gonna hit that and then I'm gonna open up. So now we're back at TNSRV02. So we're gonna press control delete. And you'll notice that it's still synchronizing. We're at now 14%. However, if we go to computers, all computers and hit refresh you'll notice that we now have one computer out of one shown and actually further on that if we open up a command prompt on tnsrv02 right click run as administrator and type in gp update slash force this will also update the uh, the gpo objects on tnsrv02 once that is completed We can click on start, settings, go to update and security. And of course there's quite a few updates. We'll hit update now. Now keep in mind that it should show up in here eventually, but you have to click on the check for updates. Once that first initial communication is done and it calls out to the server and says, hey, are there any updates? The registration is done and it should show up in here. Unfortunately, there were still some pending updates direct from Windows updates and so why, that's why this is running. But you will notice it says some settings are managed by your organization, which is a good sign. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna go back to TNSRV02. We're still synchronizing here. I'm going to turn off the microphone, turn off the audio, and uh, we'll just let this continue to run. And hopefully it'll finish so that we can uh, I can show you how to do some uh, update approval and show you what this looks like. And I'm back. Now, as you can tell, I'm wearing a different shirt. One thing that I neglected to mention 
was that the first synchronization that you do with Windows Server Update Services can actually take anywhere from 12 to 72 hours, depending on the speed of your computer, as well as the speed of your internet connection. Now, this time requirement, I believe is strictly due to the fact that I'm using Windows Internal Database, WID. There are limitations. Again, it uses SQL Express. So even if you have six, eight cores, I think it can only use a certain amount of CPU cores and they do this for licensing reasons. Um, and there's also me memory usage and handling uh, limitations which apply to SQL Express. Now, if you have Microsoft SQL Server, I believe it's a little bit different and you can actually max that out, which technically should help with the uh, the initial synchronization. So here we are, it's a new day. I started it, I think at uh, 10 o'clock AM yesterday. And as you can see with me sharing the desktop down here, it's reporting that the last synchronization completed at 3.14 a.m. this morning. So that actually took quite a bit of time. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that looking down to computers needing updates, we now have two. So if we head over to all computers and hit refresh, you'll notice that we now have both servers, TNSRV01 and TNSRV02. And this is because um, throughout the night, the uh, the new server actually went out and checked. And um, yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Now, if we go to all update, if we go to all updates, this is the panel and the administration interface that you're gonna be using to approve or decline these updates. So you'll notice here that um, the filters for this list, um, what we're looking at is the approval status is unapproved and the status of the update is either failed or needed. So technically you could change this to needed, but it, it also takes care of failed as well. So that, that works. So as you can see right now, there actually are some pending updates. So I'm gonna show you how to, uh, to accept these. So now if you wanted to accept or decline these, I'm gonna use the shift key. So you can either use the shift key and select all, or you can individually select them and hold the control button and select the certain updates that you wanna do. Then you right click, go to approve, and for all computers, we're going to mark them as approved for install. So you'll notice that the options here are approved for install, approved for removal, not approved, and apply to children. So we're just choosing the highest item in the hierarchy and choosing approved for install. So we're going to go ahead and hit OK. And what we do is we accept the, uh, the ter license terms for all the updates on behalf of all the users. And I think that's just because it's a fresh install. It's very rare to actually see that on a normal deployment. And so you'll see that uh, approval completed without errors. See below for details. So we'll hit close. Now, if we refresh this list, it's going to be blank because um, those are now approved. So they're no longer going to be showing up in this filter. You can also search for approved updates, declined updates, and any updates except for declined. We're just going to leave it to default. So now if we click on the actual server itself, TNSRV02, you'll now notice that under download status, it's reporting that updates need, uh, sorry, updates needing files is seven files. And it's also currently in the process of downloading these Windows updates. So we're, we've got about 75 megabytes of 1.1 uh, gig of updates downloaded. And further on, if we could jump back to computers, it'll actually tell you uh, installed and not installed. So for example, TNSRV01 has 99% of updates installed and same thing with TNSRV02. Now when you click on this, if you look down, we've got updates with errors are zero. We've got updates needed are six. Um, updates installed, we have 11,196 updates and then there's seven updates with no status. So now if uh, there's further reporting capabilities with WSUS, but if we were to click on this, unfortunately it tells us that you need the Microsoft Report Viewer 2012 redistributable. So in order to install that, there's a couple other prerequisites. I think there's an SQL um, component that needs to be installed. There's also some other components, but essentially you can click on that and it'll actually give you detailed information on updates that are failing um, or that need to be installed. And so just to show you this, while it's still downloading updates, I think if we go in here and choose check for updates, I'm not too sure if it has to download the entire batch before. The, yeah, so you'll notice that they're still not available even though it's in the process of downloading. But as soon as this download uh, completes, they should be made available to the server. So at this point, I'm just going to speed up the video and I'll demo the installation of the updates.
And we're back. So now you can see that the last synchronization result has succeeded. There are zero files remaining required. And so now we'll just go back to Windows Updates and we'll hit Check for Updates. And now there can be a delay after the files are downloaded because what happens is that uh, there's a number of changes that have to go into the WID database to make the updates available. So even though the files are downloaded, sometimes the updates might not be immediately available. In our case, you'll notice that um, we had two updates available there um, and now we've got Microsoft Silverlight available. And that's pretty much it. Uh, there's not much else to show. There's some uh, more group policy objects that you can modify to tailor to your environment as to how you want to have and handle the uh, Windows update patching. Um, but that's pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed the, vi the video. Please make sure that you like the video if you already haven't, subscribe to the channel, and feel free to leave me any questions or comments or feedback in the comment section. Thanks everyone, I hope you had a great day.